Hi, I'm Tom Boothway, EMS Battalion Chief for Hilton Head Island Fire Rescue. In this module, we will be covering the acute coronary syndromes. As we get started with the presentation, there are five questions that I would like you to keep in mind. First, what is the underlying pathology for the majority of the acute coronary syndromes? Second, how do we assess ACS patients and what are the goals of initial management especially out in the field. Third, what are some tricks we can use to identify acute STEMI on the 12-lead ECG? What conditions other than acute STEMI cause ST segment elevation on the 12-lead ECG? And then last, I'm gonna ask this compelling question. Have we taken the entire STEMI, non-STEMI paradigm as far as we can take it? So when we talk about the pathophysiology of acute STEMI or, or of ACS, we have to talk about the disease atherosclerosis. As the name implies, there are two main components to an atherosclerotic plaque. So this is what most people think of as coronary artery disease. And if you're like me and you eat the American diet with a, a animal-based food, a lot of fast food, junk food, things like that, um, Odds are excellent that you have some level of coronary artery disease. So if you take a look at this cross section of a diseased coronary artery, you can see in yellow here what is referred to as the atheroma. This is the fatty lipid rich gruel that we know now starts to form actually inside the innermost lining of the coronary arteries, the tunica intima. And so if you've been a CPR instructor for a long time, you've probably seen those slides from the AHA that represent coronary artery disease almost like an incrustation on the inside of a pipe. Uh, but that's not correct. We know now that this actually is growing right within the walls of the tunica intima, and oftentimes there can be almost a pathological thickening of the tunica intima that separates the atheroma from circulating blood. And it turns out that this can actually be protective because the contents of this atheroma, that lipid-rich gruel, it turns out that that is highly thrombogenic, meaning if it comes into contact with circulating blood, it can trigger a blood clot. So what is the clinical event responsible for triggering in acute coronary syndrome? Well, in most cases, we believe that clinical event is plaque rupture. So if you take a look at this next slide all the way up at the top, you can see a coronary artery that has kind of a large atheroma. And you can see here that the fibrous cap has ruptured. And so it had kind of a thin fibrous cap, probably due to inflammation, something like that, that cap has ruptured. And all of a sudden the atheroma is in direct contact with circulating blood. Well, that can actually activate platelets. And so when platelets become activated, they become spiky and they become sticky. And so they form a platelet plug because the platelets treat this like an injury on the inside of the coronary artery. Fortunately, this can often get better on its own and kind of pass by without symptoms, as you can see on the far left of this slide here. But Platelets have a very impressive uh, and potent array of chemical messengers at their disposal. And so when platelets become activated, they can actually call other platelets to the scene. They sort of put out a little APB out to other platelets and they can start to clump together in a process called platelet aggregation. So oftentimes folks that take a baby aspirin a day, something like that, it's a thromboxane A2 inhibitor, and this is the portion of the clotting cl cascade uh, that we're hoping it has its therapeutic effect, is right here with platelet aggregation. Because if these platelets end up going across the entire opening or lumen of the coronary artery, that is when uh, we have an acute myocardial infarction. So we've totally occluded this artery at this point, and then eventually fibrin comes along, lays threads across this uh, blood clot, and at that point, that clot is not going anywhere for at least 24 hours. Eventually, your body is capable of breaking down this blood clot on its own. But your heart does not have uh, 24 hours or more. 
Um, in fact, irreversible heart damage uh, to that heart muscle that was nourished downstream from this blood clot, we can start to have irreversible heart damage within about uh, an hour. So these patients need a fibrinolytic drug to help bust up this clot at this point, or they need to go to the cardiac cath lab. So when we talk about an acute coronary syndrome, what do, what do we mean? So a syndrome is nothing more than a constellation of signs and symptoms that is suggestive of some underlying pathology. That's all that is. So when we're talking about an acute coronary syndrome, we're just talking about a set of signs and symptoms that is suggestive of sudden cardiac ischemia. That's what we're talking about. So what are those signs and symptoms? They're the same ones that we have been teaching for heart attacks uh, since basic EMT school. So the cardinal sign here is chest discomfort. I try not to use the chest pain and be leading like that. So in my system, we call chest pain any unusual sensation, nose to navel, front or back. So we're casting a really wide net here uh, when, when we consider something uh, chest pain. Typical cardiac chest pain is poorly localized, meaning the patient can't really point to it with uh, two fingers. It's usually in the center of the chest. It's an uncomfortable fullness, squeezing, or pressure that lasts 15 minutes or more. An atypical chest pain would be something that had pleuritic features, so it gets worse with inspiration uh, or palpation, or if it's left or right or center, something like that, that they can point to. That would be more of an atypical uh, chest pain, epigastric pain, something like that. And then there's our pertinent negatives and our observations of these folks. So. A lot of these guys, if, if you will say, hey, if you ask them if they feel shortness of breath, even if they're not acutely short of breath, they will often uh, report a sensation of dyspnea. They will very frequently be diaphoretic. So I think anyone that's been out there in the field for a while can testify to the fact that uh, if your patient's complaining of chest pain, if they are also diaphoretic, that tends to be bad. And often you will find these folks uh, nauseated. Sometimes you will find them vomiting. These folks can present with palpitations, uh, possibly from arrhythmias, um, and they can also feel very anxious or express a feeling of impending doom. These patients can also suffer from denial because they, it's very difficult to confront the fact that you may, and very disconcerting to confront the fact that you may be uh, having a heart attack. So our average patient delay is still about an hour and a half in the United States. And oftentimes, if you discuss this with these patients, there may have been a previous occasion where they got worked up in the emergency department for chest pain. Maybe they got a bill for thousands of dollars and it turned out not to be ACS. So in those set of circumstances, they may not be that eager to go back a second time. So we also talk about the anginal equivalence. This, this was really popular I would say around the year 2000 when 12 lead ECGs were pretty new in the EMS world. Uh, we really wanted our paramedics to, we called it a very high index of suspicion, we told them. Go out there and have a high index of suspicion. And we included jaw, neck, ear, arm, or epigastric pain with or without chest pain. Uh, new onset exertional dyspnea, you will often see that in elderly people. Uh, palpitations without chest discomfort. Syncope, I have actually seen syncope several times as a presentation of acute STEMI. Unexplained fatigue, well, now we're getting into like general weakness, things like that. Um, yes, could it be acute STEMI or could it be ACS? Yes, it could. Is it likely to be? Not as likely to be. So we'll talk more about that in a second or diaphoresis unexplained by ambient temperature, especially with our diabetics. So we taught a generation of paramedics to go out there and do a lot of 12 lead ECGs on a lot of patients whose pretest probability of experiencing acute STEMI was actually kind of low. Not that it couldn't be acute STEMI, but the likelihood of it being acute STEMI uh, was kind of low. And we told them to be particularly mindful of diabetics in females and the elderly. And that's okay, I'm not discouraging that, but there's there's a, a better concept than that, I think for 2020, and that con that that concept is pretest probability. So the more compelling the presentation for ACS, uh, 
we would take even subtle ECG signs more seriously. And then the lower the pretest probability, so it's possible that the person has ACS, but it's not a real compelling uh, presentation, then the ECG signs would have to be compelling for us to call this acute STEMI from the field. So I think one of the reasons from say 2000 to 2010, that whole decade there nationwide, we had a lot of false positive STEMI activations from the field. And I think that was for two reasons. Number one, the pretest probability on, on a lot of these patients was, was low. And uh, we're not exactly famous in EMS for having outstanding data quality on our 12 lead ECGs. So if you work for a system that has a lot, a lot of false positive um, STEMI activations, one of the best things that you can do is number one, require clinical correlation, okay? Because if your patient's not really sick, there's time to sort it out in the emergency department. So you wanna have some clinical correlation and number two, you want an ECG with excellent data quality. If you meet those two criteria, uh, anecdotally, I would say that you can cut your false positive rate in half just, just by implementing uh, that change alone. So the acute coronary syndromes, we separate them into unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and then ST elevation myocardial infarction or STEMI. And the guidelines pretty much treat unstable angina and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction the same because they are indistinguishable in the first several hours. The only really difference is with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, you are gonna have this rise and fall of cardiac biomarkers. So um, yes, is it still a heart attack if it's non-ST elevation myocardial infarction? Absolutely, especially since uh, the, the God's honest truth is very frequently the stuff that we are calling non-ST elevation myocardial infarction is actually, I would argue, a, a missed STEMI. Or if not a missed STEMI, it was a really high risk non-ST elevation myocardial infarction that even according to the current guidelines probably should have gone to the cardiac cath lab. And I know that sounds like a provocative thing to say, but I'm gonna do my best to back it up uh, in the remainder of the presentation today. So why this emphasis on ST segment elevation? The emphasis is because we are using this as a surrogate for an acutely occluded coronary artery, okay? We're using this, this, this ECG sign that we call ST elevation. We're treating this as it is a perfect surrogate for an occluded coronary artery. Turns out that's not true. It's not a perfect surrogate, okay? Um, but that is why the emphasis. Is it better than Q-wave or non-Q-wave myocardial infarction? Absolutely. It was a step forward from Q-wave, non-Q-wave myocardial infarction. Uh, but it is far from perfect. So um, patients that meet guidelines tend to get better care uh, in, in the systems of care that we have built. So um, that is, that is, that's the theory anyway, is that if you have an occluded artery that you're gonna present with ST segment elevation. So in our initial assessment, if we, ass if we suspect the possibility of ACS, it's a great idea to go ahead and get your OPQRST when you're assessing these folks out in the field. Um, just go ahead and write. Uh, OPQRST right on your patient care report. So what does the O mean? It stands for onset. So in other words, what were you doing when the pain started? Has this ever happened before? Um, did it come on suddenly or did it come on gradually? Uh, P is for provocation. So is there anything that you can do to make the pain better? Is there anything that makes the pain worse? Uh, fam famously with pericarditis, the patient may feel better leaning forward. Um, it's actually true. You know, I remember re learning about this in paramedic school and it's just one of those things you learn and you're like, yeah, but, but do they really though feel better when they lean forward? Pericarditis is pretty rare. I've only seen it like maybe two or three times in my entire career. Um, but uh, yes. Uh, on those occasions, the patient has felt better leaning forward. 
Um, quality. When we ask about quality, try not to be leading and find out how the patient would describe their uh, discomfort. I would usually just say, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, um, I understand you may be having an unusual sensation in your chest. Um, how would you describe it? They might say, well, I wouldn't really say it's a pain. It's more of a pressure. They might say it feels like a, a belt. Um, they might say it feels like an elephant sitting on their chest. They might say it feels sharp or stabbing, something like that. So we want to find out how would they describe? What is the quality? What words does the patient use to describe this chest discomfort? Radiation, is this, does this comfort or is there an ache that radiates to the, the, the left arm, the right arm, the neck, the back, the jaw, uh, the teeth? Um, where is there any radiated uh, pain anywhere? And then severity. So on a scale from one to 10, with 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt in your life, how would you, if you had to give it a number, how severe is your pain? So we want to get a baseline on that. Uh, and, and then time, like in, time and onset are pretty similar. Say, well, what's the difference between onset and what is time? With time, I, I'm more interested in, has this happened before? Has it, did, did you have this yesterday? Uh, and then it went away and then it came back today. And how, how much time, like how much time has this person been having this pain uh, before they access 911? And we want to get our initial assessment with, okay, so we're getting our history with OPQRST and we want to get a, our initial set of vital signs. And what, what I ask our staff to do is to get a 12 lead ECG with the first set of vital signs. So you're establishing a baseline. So basically you want to capture any ischemic signs that are on that 12 lead ECG um, before we start to restore that balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand, okay? Because that could actually kind of clean up the 12 lead ECG a little bit. Uh, and sometimes the pre-hospital 12 lead ECG is the only sign that the patient was actually suffering coronary ischemia. So you could imagine a scenario where we deliver the patient to the emergency department. Uh, by that time, we've given nitroglycerin, we've given oxygen, all of a sudden that patient doesn't have that ST segment depression anymore. Their cardiac biomarkers come back negative. Sometimes the pre-hospital 12 lead ECG may be the only evidence that this patient really does need to be admitted. And the, diagnose re the diagnosis really is ACS. So we, we wouldn't want a patient to be sent home uh, erroneously or, or categorized as low risk when, it's, when in fact they were moderate or high risk. Of course, we wanna do uh, rhythm monitoring. Um, for patients with possible ACS. Uh, clearly, we want to monitor for any life-threatening arrhythmias, and we want to obtain uh, IV access. So what are the goals of patient management here? Number one, we want to restore that balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. Um, so if we, we optimize blood pressure, and we want to do things like give um, nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is very potent coronary vasodilator. So the, the, a coronary artery can dilate maybe five-fold in, in response to nitroglycerin. And we're going to augment their oxygen supply if they are satting, um, some say below 90%, some say below uh, 93%. If they are not in respiratory distress and they are satting in the mid-90s, uh, they do not need a non-breather mask blowing their hair back um, but you might decide to only give them a nasal cannula, let's say at a couple liters per minute. And we want to triage these folks to get reperfusion therapy when it is indicated because the true goal here, especially with acute STEMI, is general myocardial salvage. We want to prevent irreversible heart damage with ACS patients uh, whenever possible. So we're maintaining SATs above 93%. We want to give uh, aspirin. So the second international study of infarct survival showed a 25% mortality benefit with aspirin alone. So a lot of times on a quest test question, they'll say, what is the most important drug that you can give a patient uh, that is suffering ACS? And usually on the national registry exam, a question like that, the answer would be like oxygen or something like that. But in reality, if you really look at the evidence, there is a ton of, uh, of evidence for aspirin. Uh, 
Does it have to be given pre-hospital? Not necessarily, uh, but it definitely needs to be given. Uh, nitroglycerin, again, so we want to open up those coronary arteries, maybe take advantage of collateral circulation. Um, uh, pain control. Why do we want to control someone's pain uh, that is experiencing ACS or if they're having crushing substernal chest pain? It is because pain, or at least the theory is, pain increases sympathetic tone, which increases myocardial oxygen demand. So we want to treat that pain. Um, so in, in theory, it's also the right thing to do. I mean, if somebody is in severe pain and it, you know, it's a form of suffering, someone is, is suffering pain and, and anxiety, part of good medicine is alleviating pain and anxiety. We want to be prepared to defibrillate. So, um, patient with acute STEMI, it's an excellent idea to get those defibrillator pads out. Um, because you know, a lot of times there's a, you know, there's certainly a risk that these patients could experience VF between our patient contact and delivery to the hospital. Um, it's a minority of occasions, but it definitely happens. It has happened many, many times um, that, that I know of personally or friends of mine in my EMS service over the years. It, uh, it is something that, that happens. And we also need to start thinking of um, time is therapy when it comes to triaging patients with acute STEMI to the cardiac cath lab. These, this is, this is what they really need. They read, they need reperfusion more than anything. They need to go here to the cardiac cath lab for balloon angioplasty. Um, so you can see here on the left, um, that little white arrow. This is a occlusion of the left anterior descending artery. And then in the middle frame here, you can see balloon inflation. So they've crossed this lesion with a wire and they're inflating the balloon. And then you can see a really nice result here on the right hand side uh, with the left anterior descending artery open back up. And then hopefully um, in a high functioning system of care, uh, we obtain outcome data whenever possible. So um, PCI hospitals, um, they oftentimes have things like chest pain accreditation. And so part of that is communicating back with the EMS system and kind of sharing system level data so that we can work together to get first medical contact to balloon time uh, accomplished in 90 minutes or less. And this is something that can be improved like anything else. Um, just with education and non-punitive feedback. So how do we identify acute STEMI on the 12 lead ECG? So I'm going to try and give you some tips here. This is not a comprehensive treatment of 12 lead ECG interpretation. It's kind of be, it's going to be a little bit of a speed round here, um, but we'll, we'll go over some tips and we'll try and go kind of easy to hard here. And I'm going to assume for the purposes of this module that you're already familiar with the contiguous leads. So we have the inferior leads here that make up the lower left-hand corner of the 12 lead ECG leads two, three and AVF. Um, the high lateral leads one and AVL tend to be reciprocal to those. Um, and then in the precordial leads, you've got V1 and V2, which we call the septal leads. They're usually or very frequently grouped together with the anterior leads. Sometimes people are like, okay, well, I use, I think of like, I see all leads for inferior septal, anterior lateral, or, or some kind of trick that you can use to remember uh, your, your, which leads are, are um, contiguous. I would just say with anterior leads, just look at the patient's anterior chest, right? So they literally anatomically are paced, placed on the patient's anterior chest. So V1, V2, V3, and V4, are right on the patient's anterior chest. They are also the anterior leads that correspond uh, with anterior myocardial infarction. So if it helps to think of it that way. And then the so-called low lateral leads down here, leads B5 and B6 that are literally anatomically on the patient's lateral left chest. Um, so those are the contiguous leads. And then the, um, the reciprocal leads. So I'll go ahead and, and um, include these in a handout if you'd like so that you can print these out and use them as we go over ECGs here. But for me, at least the way my brain is wired, this isn't very helpful to me. I need to actually be looking at an ECG to really 
understand. Um, but but it, but you do. But it is possible to correlate infarct location with the 12 lead ECG. And so one of the things that's often forgotten about in an ECG class is the normal ECG. I would encourage you um, to look at a lot of normal ECGs. It's very difficult to recognize abnormal if you don't have a really solid understanding of what normal is supposed to look like. I know most of us learned how to read heart rhythms in lead two, which is a which is perfectly legitimate, right? Why do we look at lead two for heart rhythms? Well, because in most patients, you get an upright P wave, an upright QRS complex, and an upright T wave. So it's really a good uh, lead for cardiac monitoring. Um, but if you have an opportunity to look at, at normal ECGs, I think it's very, very helpful to just get kind of wrap your mind on what normal T waves are supposed to look like and other things like anterior R wave progression. Um, so that when you're in the presence of pathology and you're looking and trying to decide, is this early repole, is this normal, that you have, you have a really solid understanding of normal. This is the classic criteria right now, or at least the criteria that is used right now for what is considered to be significant ST segment elevation. I don't pay too much attention here, right? Because the the number of millimeters of ST elevation at the end of the day is completely arbitrary. Our guidelines do not take into account uh, what is known as the rule of proportionality. And that is basically means that uh, repolarization is proportional to depolarization. Another way to say that is the bigger the QRS complex, we, you know, and, and what does a QRS complex represent? The QRS complex represents depolarization. Well, if you have a lot of voltage, you have a lot of, like, let's say a really deep S wave in lead V2, we would expect a corresponding large T wave. The T wave is repolarization, and that's what we're talking about here. So this is the reason that left ventricular hypertrophy can be an anterior STEMI mimic. And conversely, it's the reason that we have to be careful if we have really low voltage ECG, because then maybe even half a millimeter of ST segment elevation uh, would be significant. So, but if you look at the guidelines here, what they say now is, okay, we want a millimeter or more of ST segment elevation in two or more anatomically contiguous leads, except for leads V2 and V3, in which case for females, we want one and a half millimeters, or for males, we want two millimeters. Um, they are trying way too hard here. I think it would have been a lot simpler just to explain the rule of proportionality, um, but, but, but this will make more sense uh, as we as we go along here. So let's try and go from easy to hard. I don't have any uh, extremely difficult ECGs in the presentation today. Again, this isn't a comprehensive treatment of 12 lead interpretation. Uh, but let's but let's talk about some some strategies here to identify acute STEMI. One of the most important strategies, by the way, is to obtain serial 12 lead ECGs. So if you Consider this example here of a patient that presented to EMS with chest discomfort, and you look at example one, this is a non-diagnostic 12-lead ECG. As a matter of fact, on a cold read, I probably would have been more worried about the inferior leads here because it looks like there might be a little teeny bit of ST segment depression and lead AVL there. Um, but then when we go over to our second ECG, all of a sudden, um, where the, the T waves are kind of changing appearance there in the anterior leads. And then by the third ECG, we have a significant amount of ST elevation, a clear injury pattern. And then by the fourth ECG, you know, it's really starting to kind of tombstone. So just remember a single, a, a single 12 lead ECG is like a single set of vital signs. It is a snapshot in time. And so changing ECG suggests the dynamic myocardial oxygen supply versus demand characteristics of true ACS. So always get at least two 12 lead ECGs. One uh, at the time that you're initially assessing the patient and at least one more as you're pulling into the hospital. Most EKGs nowadays, most monitors um, will do automatic ST segment monitoring, which can be helpful as well. So let's take a look at uh, what I would consider the bunny slope of 12 lead ECG interpretation, and that is acute inferior STEMI. Uh, 
And remember, we want to always consider pretest probability. So if I were to tell you, okay, this was a 72 year old male. It was two in the afternoon. This is a retired guy. He just got back from golfing. Um, he felt sick. He looks acutely unwell. He's pale. He's diaphoretic. He's rubbing his chest. He's having chest discomfort. Um, and he says he thinks he's having a heart attack. How is that pre, is that pretest probability high or is that pretest probability low? Well, it's high. It's really high. This guy thinks he's having a heart attack. He looks acutely ill, looks like a picture of shock. He's having typical chest discomfort. So right off the rip, we know the pretest probability is high. So we go ahead and, and uh, get this guy's vital signs. We capture an initial 12 lead ECG and this kind of prints off the monitor here. Well, what do we see? When we look at any 12 lead ECG, we want to start with rate and rhythm. So if we look at rate here, you can just kind of go to the top of the ECG. It says heart rate 60. Well, if you remember your large block method for heart rate determination, we know that there ought to be about five large blocks between our waves here. So the heart rate's about 60. Um, if we go to, let's say, let's go to lead two, see what kind of rhythm we're in here. Uh, do we have P waves? Yes, we do. Do we have QRS complexes? Yes, we do. Are they in a one-to-one -one relationship? They are, and they have a constant PR interval. Uh, the computer is measuring the PR interval here at 132 milliseconds. Is that between 120 and 200? Yes. So we've met our criteria for sinus rhythm here. Okay, so we have sinus rhythm, borderline sinus bradycardia at a rate of 60. So then I would say, okay, well, do we have any seg uh, ST segment elevation here? Well, yes, we do. We have some really obvious ST segment elevation here in lead two, three, and AVF. That makes up the lower left-hand corner of the ECG. What leads are those? Ah, they are the inferior leads. So if you, if you suspect acute inferior STEMI, um, there is a sign that is so sensitive and so specific that the absence of this finding should make you question the diagnosis and that is a reciprocal change in lead AVL. So one way to think about that is just say, well, is there a downsloping ST segment in, in lead AVL? Yes, we have a really obvious reciprocal change in lead AVL. We also have a reciprocal change in lead one, by the way. So the high lateral leads one in AVL are reciprocal to leads two, three in AVF. The thing is, depending on the, the location of the occlusion in the right coronary artery, you may or may not have a reciprocal change in lead one, uh, but 99 plus percent of the time, you will have a reciprocal change in lead AVL. And so here we have that reciprocal change. That is strong supportive evidence that we're dealing uh, with a real McCoy here, a true acute inferior STEMI. So I would say at this point, the paramedics have all the information they need to go ahead and pick up that radio and announce code STEMI um, and, and, and do whatever your STEMI protocol requires. Uh, in our system, we announce code STEMI uh, and then we transmit the ECG to the emergency department and then we follow up with a phone call. Now, should all of that be necessary? Probably not, but especially at three o'clock in the morning, um, you know, the emergency physicians have to call the consultant in from home. And these cardiologists like to get a clinical vignette. And so it, on some level, it becomes, okay, what do you need from us to activate the cardiac cath lab? And if the answer is, well, we need a clinical vignette, we need to see the ECG, uh, then that's what we make happen. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us, um, it's about the patient. So this is acute inferior STEMI. There's one more finding on this ECG that's worth pointing out. And that is, if take a look at this and say, are there any other reciprocal changes other than the ones that we've already mentioned in leads one uh, and AVL? And the answer is yes. We have reciprocal changes here in the right precordial leads. Now, I'm not talking about modified right-sided chest leads. That's different. When I say the right-sided uh, precordial leads, I just mean leads V1, V2, and V3 because they are literally to the right of leads V4, V5, and V6. So I tend to call these the right precordial leads and we call leads V4, V5, and V6 the left precordial leads. So we do, we have reciprocal changes there. Okay, 
Reciprocal to what though? And, and what you're seeing here is actually uh, reciprocal to the posterior wall of the left ventricle. Because the posterior descending artery branches off the right coronary artery in, in the majority of folks. And so uh, in this particular case, now generally speaking, we don't put leads on the patient's back, okay? Um, but we very frequently will see posterior reciprocal changes in the, in the right precordial leads in the presence of acute inferior STEMI. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I always want you to look at the right precordial leads when you look at an obvious home run, slam dunk, acute inferior STEMI. This is the easiest STEMI to identify by far. Um, but what's interesting is if you always look for these reciprocal changes in the right precordial leads, you can train your eyes to see acute isolated posterior STEMI because sometimes that will be the only abnormality on the 12 lead ECG is this ST segment depression in the right precordial leads. And I would still call that STEMI, even if there was no ST elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF. I would call it acute isolated posterior STEMI. So that just remember that when you're looking at inferior STEMI, there's an opportunity to train yourself to get really, really good at spotting acute isolated posterior STEMI. Uh, and we're going to look at some examples of that as we go forward here in the presentation. Okay, let's talk about right ventricular uh, infarction, okay? Um, so a lot of times I think we blame right ventricular infarction um, when we give nitroglycerin to patients with acute STEMI and we bottom out their pressure, there's a tendency to be like, oh, well, it must have been right ventricular infarction. When in reality, sometimes we're giving nitroglycerin to patients who are not a good candidate for nitroglycerin in the first place. Why? Because they were borderline bradycardic or they were already had a very marginal blood pressure. Okay. So really any patient um, can have their blood pressure drop with nitroglycerin, right? So we want to always remember, we want to have a decent heart rate and we want to have a decent blood pressure before we give nitroglycerin. Having said that, I do believe there is a hypotensive syndrome that can take place with right ventricular infarction. And so a lot of times in the past, I've heard this referred to as, as patients with right ventricular infarction are preload dependent, okay? What do we mean by that? Well, when the right ventricle is infarcted, okay, um, it can become stunned. And when the, in the right ventricle, it's kind of thin. It sort of attaches to the left ventricle like a pocket. When it becomes stunned, it basically becomes a conduit through which blood flows. And when that, when that occurs, patients are very dependent on central venous pressure to maintain their cardiac output. What does nitroglycerin do to central venous pressure? Well, it drops it, okay? So how do we know when to suspect right ventricular infarction? Well, we should think of this as a possible complication of acute inferior STEMI. Why? Because very frequently with acute inferior STEMI, the culprit artery is the right coronary artery. But if you go high enough up in the right coronary artery, in other words, if you have a proximal occlusion of the right coronary artery, you are knocking out the right ventricle on the way down to the inferior wall of the left ventricle, okay? So if, if, you, have, if you can see acute inferior STEMI on the 12 lead ECG and you suspect the possibility that this is the right coronary artery, you have to wonder like, where is this occlusion in the, in the, in the right coronary artery? Because the higher up it is toward the aorta, the higher the chance that it is also knocking out the right ventricle. And again, if you knock out the right ventricle, it may not be pumping correctly. So these patients are dependent on central venous pressure. So I had read about this. Uh, this, this case right here that I'm about to go over is really old. This is like a 20 year old case. I had just read about right ventricular infarction. And, um, and so, but, but let's, let me set this up for you, okay? So this was a 79 year old female. She had been out shopping with her sister when she started to experience chest discomfort, okay? So we arrived at the strip mall, pulled up alongside this store, helped this woman up into the ambulance. 
um, started to get her OPQRST, got her undressed from the waist up, and and uh, as we, so, I'm getting this. I'm getting a set of vital signs. I'm getting my initial 12 lead ECG. I asked her, "Has this ever happened before?" And she says, "She says yes, it has." And I said, "Well, well, when did it happen?" She said, "When I had my heart attack." Okay, well that got my attention. I said, "Okay, well, how does today's chest pain compare to the day that you had your heart attack?" She said, "It feels exactly the same." Okay. Well, would we say pretest probability is high or pretest probability is low? Once again, we'd have to say pretest probability is high. This is not this woman's first rodeo. She has experienced these exact same signs and symptoms before. So this comes off uh, the monitor. Okay. So what is the heart rate here? Uh, 68. All right. If we go to lead two, do we have P waves and QRS complexes in a one-to-one -one relationship? Yes, we do. Uh, with a constant PR interval, which is, um, let's see, it's measured here. I think that says at 188 milliseconds, which is between 120 and 200. Okay, normal sinus rhythm. Do we see any ST elevation anywhere? Yes, once again, leads two, three in AVF. We have ST elevation. What's our secret sign now to help rule this in? Again, we're going to look for a reciprocal change. Uh, in the high lateral lead, specifically lead AVL, do we have a downsloping ST segment in lead AVL? Uh, we do. So again, this is all the evidence that we need to pick up that radio and announce acute STEMI. Um, but in this particular occasion, when we look at the right precordial leads, do we have reciprocal changes uh, representing posterior extension? No, we don't. As a matter of fact, there might even be a little bit of ST segment elevation in lead V1, which is kind of interesting because lead V1 is the only precordial lead on the right side of the patient's chest, okay? Now, I had read about right ventricular infarction uh, from an article by H.J. Uh, Wellens, and I knew that you could take lead V4, unsnap it, snap it on a new electrode and move it over to the mirror position on the right side of the patient's chest. And then if it had ST elevation, um, then there's an excellent chance your patient is suffering right ventricular infarction. So I'm like, okay, well, here's my big chance to, to identify that. So I went ahead and did that. And here is the ECG uh, that I acquired. You'll notice that lead V4R here, which I've blown up for you, it is a very small QRS complex. It's only a couple of millimeters deep. Now, remember the rule of proportionality states that um, in the presence of really, really small QRS complex, our threshold for what is a significant amount of ST elevation is less. Even, even without that though, this is still at least a millimeter of ST segment elevation. So uh, this is definitely a significant amount of ST elevation considering the small size of this QRS complex. So this is positive for right ventricular infarction. This woman's initial pressure was like 100 over 55. And honestly, now I felt like I was in a conundrum. Do we give the nitroglycerin? Do we not give the nitroglycerin? Well, at the time I thought, Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start an IV and I'm gonna do a preemptive fluid bolus of 500 milliliters of saline, get that pressure augmented a little bit, and then I'm gonna do a trial dose of nitroglycerin. Uh, so that's what I did. I gave this woman a bolus of saline, which did bring her pressure up. I gave her one nitroglycerin and her pressure went down to like 90 over 40 with one nitroglycerin. So I was like, that's it, you know, no more bets. Okay, um, and, and, and actually I was like, I'm, I'm not sure that was a good idea. So I took this woman to the hospital. I did not have a good handoff at the hospital. I tried to communicate with the attending physician and explain that I thought that this patient had right ventricular infarction. Uh, and for whatever reason, this attending physician just uh, was not listening this particular day. So I sat down and started filling out my patient care report. And about five, 10 minutes later, I heard a big, big commotion uh, in bed one. And a nurse that I knew pretty well was running out to get a bag of saline. So I said, hey, you know, what's going on in there? And she said, well, the patient's blood pressure has bottomed out. And I said, well, what are you guys doing in there? And she said, well, uh, we put her on a nitro drip and we gave her 10 milligrams of morphine. Hmm, 
interesting. So I said to the unit secretary, hey, can you print me out a 12 lead? Because they were able to, to, to uh, print 12 lead ECGs from the nurse's station. So if you take a look at this ECG here, and you can say, take a look at, say, uh, lead three here. You can see that there's a significant amount of ST elevation. You can see how much ST elevation there is, uh, let's say, in lead V1. Take a look at the, this next ECG here. Okay, so now this, this ST segment, of the, first of all, the heart rate is now gone up to about 80. The ST elevation is worsening. Now we have kind of like a doming or upward convexity of the ST segment elevation in lead V1. We have new ST elevation in V4 and V5 and V6. <clears throat> this um, the STEMI is getting worse because they've bottomed out this woman's blood pressure. Fortunately, um, they were able to get this stabilized. The cath team showed up in the emergency department and they're getting ready to transport this woman to the cardiac cath lab. And I just go and grab my clipboard and stuff and I just followed the convoy. And I went up to the cardiac cath lab because I wanted to see the, you know, the last chapter in the story. I wanted to see what happened next. And so um, they let me sit down in the monitoring room and uh, watch this procedure. So at this point, the patient was loaded, um, placed on the cath lab table. And so this is the ST segment elevation before. And then they crossed the lesion with a wire. So in this next ECG, what you're going to see is greater than 50% resolution of this ST segment elevation. And there it is. Okay. Now this woman was under conscious sedation, but I'll never forget. I could hear her over the speaker. She said, oh, I don't know what you guys just did, but I feel so much better. And I thought, well, that is very, very interesting. We could debate whether or not these folks should get morphine or they should get fentanyl or how should we could should uh, control a patient's pain. Nothing makes these patients feel better than reperfusion. And that was a uh, important lesson that I learned that day. Okay, so that is right ventricular infarction. Now let's talk about acute anterior STEMI. And we are going to start here. Uh, well, we're going to show you a obvious one. Not all anterior STEMIs are obvious. And uh, so I'll explain uh, why this one uh, is, is, a, uh, is one that you would hope to be able to interpret, okay? So um, this, this uh, 60 year old male here uh, with typical chest discomfort. So let's say that this person has a good presentation. You have no reason to believe that this isn't that perfectly consi consistent um, with ACS. And we've obtained an ECG with excellent data quality. The heart rate here is um, 67. And uh, this patient is in sinus rhythm. So we always start with rate and rhythm. Say, okay, well, is there any ST segment elevation anywhere? Uh, yeah, there is. We have ST segment elevation in lead V1, V2, V3, V4, uh, and V5. Okay. Now, in the beginning of my career, um, you know, back in the late 90s, I probably would have called this anteroseptal STEMI with lateral extension. I don't do that anymore. I just would call this an extensive anterior STEMI. Um, or uh, Stephen Smith calls these just LAD occlusion um, because there's an excellent, uh, odds are excellent that the culprit artery here is the left anterior descending. So this is pretty impressive uh, amount of ST elevation. I would say this is pretty obvious STEMI, but what is particularly helpful about this example is when you have a more proximal LAD occlusion, the infarct very frequently, we call it crosses over to the limb leads. And when it crosses over to the limb leads, it can cross over to the inferior leads. Far more commonly, it crosses over to the high lateral leads. Now, the high lateral leads are funny, right? The, the high lateral leads are often what Stephen Smith refers to as electrocardiographically silent. One of the reasons for that is that is the QRS complexes in leads one in AVL tend to be kind of small. And in this example, you'll notice these, these QRS complexes are, you know, they appear to be less than five millimeters tall or right at five millimeters tall. They're not very big. And so you might look at that and go, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that looks like ST elevation, but you know what? Those T waves are disproportionately large considering the relatively small size of the QRS complexes. What's important about anterior STEMI crossing over to the high lateral leads 
is that unlocks reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. So just as before we had ST elevation in 2, 3 and AVF and we look for our reciprocal change in lead AVL, in this particular case, we have these, we have ST elevation in the anterior leads. It's crossed over to the high lateral leads. And so now we have our reciprocal changes in the inferior leads, 2, 3 and AVF. Uh, your most sensitive lead generally in this uh, situation will be lead three. With mid LAD occlusion, you will not always have that added security of getting a reciprocal change. So sometimes you'll be looking at the right precordial leads. You're like, gosh, I think, is that ST elevation? These S waves are kind of deep. Could this be left ventricular hypertrophy, something like that? In those cases, you can kind of look for poor R wave progression because a lot of times, like in this case, there are there's no R wave at all in lead V1. It doesn't look like there's an R wave in lead V2 either. There's a very, very small kind of a nub of an R wave in V3. And then, and then you have a fairly decent R wave in lead V4. Usually, if this is early repoll, you will have excellent R wave progression. So if you didn't have these obvious reciprocal changes, you need to do other things like consider the presence or absence of R waves or remember um, serially obtained ECGs. If you have any doubts, one of the reasons that you're getting your ECG with the first set of vital signs is so that you can obtain another ECG uh, five or 10 minutes later. All right, let's move on to lateral STEMI, and we're gonna look at high lateral STEMI, speaking of electrocardiographically silent high lateral STEMI. So uh, this particular case, 54 year old patient, don't remember if this was a, a male or a female, not really relevant to, uh, to the point I'm gonna try and make here. Our staff wasn't sure that this was in acute STEMI. So they went out, the patient had a pretty good clinical presentation, um, we've got the star, 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 acute my suspected message. So this is the old GE Marquette interpretive algorithm from the LifePak 12. And, you know, some people are like, don't like the computerized interpretation. There are EMS systems that have turned off the uh, computerized interpretation. I like the computerized interpretation because it's the same, right? I, you may have a uh, hundred paramedics in your EMS service that are that have a hundred different skill levels at interpreting an ECG. Um, in theory, the computer interprets it the same way every time. Um, so it is a supplement. It's a tool, right? It should be overread by the paramedic, uh, but it needs to be well understood. So when you, when you have clinical correlation, so you've got good pretest probability, and you've obtained a ECG with good data quality. Okay, so now. You get this ECG, you're looking at it. Now our staff saw a lot of ST segment depression here, but they're like, they weren't sure, like, is there ST elevation? I'm, I'm looking for the STEMI, I'm not sure that I see it, but look, the computer thinks it sees something. So remember this when your computer says star, 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 STEMI, star, 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 ST elevation, myocardial infarction, something like that. That is almost always a subordinate message, meaning it's being triggered by one of the messages below it, okay? And things like age undetermined can't do it. So it's gonna be an interpretive statement with the word acute, or it's gonna be an inter interpretive statement with the word injury or both. So if you wanna know what the computer thinks it sees here, keep reading, okay? Abnormal ECG, normal sinus rhythm, okay? Sure enough, uh, this patient's in sinus rhythm cannot rule out anterior infarct, age undetermined. Eh, nope, age undetermined can't trip that message. Lateral injury, ding, 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 pattern. Lateral injury pattern. That word injury right there is tripping that acute of my suspected message, okay? Okay, well, what are our lateral leads? Let's look at the low lateral leads, V5 and V6. Do we see any ST elevation there? No, in fact, we see X ST segment depression there. So that can't be what the computer's talking about. Oh, okay, well, how about the high lateral leads one in AVL? Well, gosh, lead one looks pretty normal. Uh, maybe a half a millimeter at most, but maybe no ST elevation at all. How about lead AVL? Oh, wait a minute, you know what? If you measure at the J point, we have at least a millimeter of ST segment elevation in lead AVL. 
Now, this is really, really important because remember, the high lateral leads can be so-called electrocardiographically silent. If you have ST elevation in the high lateral leads, even a little bit of ST elevation in the high lateral leads, look for reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. Specifically, look at lead three. Do we have a downsloping ST segment in lead three? Yes. Anytime you have reciprocal behavior between lead AVL and lead three, stop, think about it. That should at least make your spider sense tingle, okay? But our staff wasn't sure. But fortunately, they got this 12 lead ECG with the first set of vital signs. So after they locked the back door, fed the cat, talked to the security guard, whatever they needed to do to kind of button up this scene and get this patient in the back of the ambulance, before they left the scene, they were able to get another uh, 12 lead ECG. This can be really important for EMS systems that are trying to choose between the local community hospital that maybe doesn't have a cath lab and the PCI hospital that might be further away, might be in a different direction, okay? If you get your first 12 lead ECG with the first set of vital signs, you get another bite at the apple after you load the patient for transport before you leave the scene. So I want you to take a look at this ECG and then I want you to take a look at this next ECG that was taken about 10 minutes later. Ooh, now all of a sudden, if you look at lead AVL, that S wave has been lifted up above the isoelectric line. And now it's like it's got this doming, this upward convexity of the ST segment. Uh, at this point, we have at least a millimeter of ST elevation there uh, in, in lead one. Uh, we've kind of got lead V2 taking on the appearance of lead AVL. Now, when this happens, this happens a lot, by the way, and this can be very confusing for people when all of a sudden they have ST elevation uh, in the right precordial leads. Most people place leads V1 and V2 high, what I call high and wide, too high on the chest and too far apart. And the higher and wider you place leads V1 and V2, the more they can start to take on the appearance of lead AVR and AVL. So I suspect that lead V2 here is just sort of creeping up toward uh, the upper left chest, which is starting to get toward lead AVL's territory. And so it's starting to kind of take on that high lateral appearance there. Uh, not 100% definite, but I, I've seen this enough times, especially in the presence of things like paced rhythms, um, that I wonder about lead placement in this particular case. But it doesn't matter. We have changes on serially obtained ECGs uh, in a patient that presented with signs and symptoms of ACS. Uh, guys, this is more than enough evidence for us to declare a code STEMI, um, transmit the ECG at the hospital if that's something that you need to do, follow up with a phone call, give them their clinical vignette. That's what we do in my system. It's just the way that it is. Uh, do whatever you need to do and hopefully that they can um, get this patient to the cath lab as soon as possible. So that is a high lateral STEMI there. Um, here's an example of a low lateral STEMI. So we're talking about leads B5 and B6. This was um, one particular night. I had just brought in a patient, uh, not a particularly emergent patient. And a friend of mine from a neighboring EMS system came in and he's like, hey, Boothalay, what's going on, man? Take a look at this. Slaps the CCG. Uh, to his credit, he uh, had a really sharp eye to identify this particular STEMI. Uh, and the cath lab team was there to take this person up to the cath lab. So, you know, a lot of times we're not very good at identifying lateral STEMI. If you look at the NERMI database, the NERMI database, so this is the National Registry of Myocardial Infarction Database, um, about 40 of the 40 percent of the heart attacks in there are on anterior about 40 percent uh, are inferior and like 20 percent are lateral and almost none of them are posterior so you would almost think well my gosh patients just don't have heart attacks in the distribution of the circumflex they just have them in the right coronary artery and the left anterior descending do you really believe that guys come on your heart has three main coronary arteries I think really that should be like more like 33%, 33%, 33%. The reality is number one, the 12 lead ECG is an imperfect test uh, and, and that we don't place any leads on the patient's back and we can do kind of a very mediocre job looking at the lateral wall. Okay, moving back to this case here. If you took a look at this, um, 
you could almost peter out before you got to the end of this ECG and sort of give up. At first glance, there's nothing super, super frightening about this ECG, but it's like, okay, wait a minute. Let's, say, let's assume this patient had good signs and symptoms of ACS here. We've got pretty good data quality. This is where, at least in my mind, the computer can save you at three o'clock in the morning, right? Even though this is just past midnight here. It's got the acute my suspected message. Remember, you can keep reading sinus bradycardia with sinus arrhythmia. So we do have sinus P waves here. Uh, the computer's detecting a little bit of irregularity uh, in, in the R to R interval. ST elevation, consider lateral injury, ding, 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 or acute, ding, 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 infarct. So this isn't age undetermined here. This says the words injury and it says the uh, words acute. Okay. Well, how about we take a look at those lateral leads? This time, if we look at leads V5 and V6, it's like, actually, you know what? I think I've got a millimeter of ST elevation here in lead V5. I've got maybe a millimeter and a half of ST elevation here in lead V6. Someone might look at the CCG and go, well, there's a little notch here in the J point here in lead V6. And you know what? There's a notch in the J point in lead one, which is a high lateral lead. I wonder if this is pericarditis because you know what? You will see notch J points with early repole. You will see it with uh, pericarditis. But remember, pericarditis is rare. Only about one, or sorry, 2% of patients who present with both chest pain and ST segment elevation. So if you were a Vegas odds maker, what is the mo more likely scenario? The more likely scenario is acute STEMI in this particular case. And if you look at the right precordial leads, now you generally will not read this in a book, uh, but many times I have noticed when you have ST elevation that is sort of isolated to leads V5 and V6, you very frequently will see posterior changes in the right precordial leads. So that uh, ST depression there in lead V2, is that significant? Yes, I would say that is a posterior change. And I'll bet you if you went around that patient's back and continued with lead V7, V8, and V9, that ST elevation would continue to grow as you wrapped around that patient's uh, back. But in this particular case, uh, my, my friend Brian didn't need that because uh, he, he was kind of sharp-eyed and did an excellent job. And kudos to the emergency physician for taking this and calling in a consultant uh, past midnight. That was the right thing to do. This patient was absolutely having a heart attack. Okay, the one you've been waiting for, isolated posterior STEMI. Okay, this is frequently missed. A lot of people think that this is rare. I, I don't think that it's so rare as much it is frequently ignored to quote uh, Stephen Smith. So I will tell you there is no ST segment elevation on this ECG. Okay, none at all, which technically would make this a so-called STEMI equivalent, okay? Or uh, in OMI, an occlusion myocardial infarction might even be a better way to describe this, okay? So even though if you look hard enough, you can find isolated posterior STEMI in the STEMI guidelines, um, even in the guidelines, it's almost like they're holding their nose when they talk about this particular ECG abnormality. And in fact, this was not identified in real time. And very frequently when I find isolated posterior STEMIs, I find them in post-event review. Okay. So this patient didn't go to the cath lab right away. This patient was admitted to the ICU, uh, the, continued to have chest discomfort, Second set of biomarkers came back positive. Third set of biomarkers came back positive, was cathed the next day and had an, an occlusion in the, uh, in the circumflex or the obtuse marginal, one of those two, um, not till the next day. And it was not, believe me, they don't ever come back and say, we missed a STEMI, okay? Diagnosis, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And that happens, guys, that happens so frequently not just at my hospital. I mean, I've talked to colleagues all over the country uh, and even internationally. This is something that just happens quite a bit. Okay, so how do we know? And by the way, isn't it interesting? You won't see this every day either. There is the star, 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 acute my suspected message at the top. And if we keep reading, you'll notice it says posterior infarct, possibly ding, 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 acute. I, you know, honestly, I had never seen that before. I had never seen 
the old GE Marquette algorithm give the star, star, star message on an ECG that had no ST elevation on it. But the computer got it. The computer got this. It was missed by, uh, you know, it was missed by, uh, I don't know if it was missed by the treating paramedic. The, the emergency physician was not impressed with this particular ECG on, on this particular day, unfortunately. But if you take a look at the right precordial leads here, you will see that we have isolated ST segment depression. So uh, the saying here is ischemia does not localize. And we know that from cardiac stress testing. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if this is just, you know, subendocardial ischemia, we would expect global ST segment depression across the entire 12 lead ECG. So when you have ST segment depression that is isolated to a particular set of leads, that is more likely to represent a posterior, I'm sorry, that is more likely to represent a reciprocal change than so-called anterior ischemia, which is a misnomer, okay? Because typically with posterior STEMI, you will have ST segment depression that is maximal here in the right precordial leads, where as opposed to global ST depression, and in most cases, really it's more maximal in the left precordial leads, V4, V5, and V6. But in this case, especially V2 here, we have a very classical appearance of posterior STEMI. Um, the, the, uh, Thomas, Dr. Thomas Garcia, author of 12 lead ECG, The Art of Interpretation, referred to this sign as a carousel pony. And you do have to use your imagination here, uh, but that creeping up of the R wave there, that we call that an RS ratio greater than one because the R wave is taller than the S wave is deep. That's almost like a, um, like the, a, a bar on a carousel that a child could hold on to. And then you have this uh, distinctive down up ST segment depression. And you can see like as it goes up, it's almost like a bump on the back of the saddle. It's referred to as a carousel pony. And I know that sounds ridiculous. And I bet you can't wait to start drawing this on your ECGs when you show it to the emergency physician in the emergency department. But you will be amazed how often you will see this sign with acute isolated posterior STEMI. Um, so if we look at this actual ECG with that carousel pony superimposed, you can see what I'm talking about here. Guys, look for this sign. I guarantee you're going you're gonna to find it. Another thing that you can do is sort of flip this ECG over and hold it up to a light. This is the so-called mirror image test. Now, other folks have made, fun of, uh, have made fun of this before. Guys, this has been in the medical literature since the 1950s. This is, I'm not making this up, right? So you just flip the ECG over and hold it up to a light. And now you can kind of see there in lead B2, this, this is really, that increased R wave, in lead V2 is really a reciprocal Q wave uh, from the posterior wall of the, of the left ventricle. And so when you flip this over, you can kind of see the ST segment elevation and see how these reciprocal changes in the right precordial leads really represent these unviewed posterior leads on the patient's back. Now, I know some of you are going, why don't you just put leads on the patient's back? Can you do that? Yes, of course you can. You can do a so-called 15 or 18 lead ECG, or you could just put one or two leads on the patient's back, usually in the position of uh, V8, which is just kind of like mid scapular, or V9, which is paraspinal, on the same side of the spine as lead V8, um, and look for ST elevation. The only problem is, now it's very helpful when those leads come back positive, then you can hand that to the emergency physician and go, hey, look, ST elevation in two contiguous leads, even though they're modified posterior chest leads. But just remember, post posterior chest leads can be falsely negative, which can confuse the diagnosis of acute isolated posterior STEMI. Very helpful if they show ST, ele uh, ST elevation back there. But just remember, just because you don't have ST elevation, you cannot rule out the existence of posterior STEMI with posterior chest leads. That's just something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, if you use that trick. Again, I normally see isolated posterior STEMI during post-event review. I look at almost every 12 lead ECG that is obtained in my department. And when I see an EKG like this right here, I go, oh geez, you know, here we have atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, and we have ST elevation in leads B2, V3, and V4, and V5, okay? Well, is this ischemia or is this posterior STEMI? I'll pull the case and I'll go, oh, great. This patient really presented with classic signs and symptoms of ACS. Uh, in this particular example, they caught it. 
okay? The emergency physician called in the cath team on this particular case, which is great. Um, but a lot of times these just do not show up on my STEMI report, okay? Uh, on our quarterly STEMI data. A lot of these get thrown out by the hospital, okay? And this is one of the issues I have with uh, with STEMI non with the whole STEMI non STEMI paradigm. Okay, what conditions mimic acute STEMI on the twelve lead ECG? Or to say it another way, what other conditions cause ST segment elevation on the twelve lead ECG? Well, one of those conditions is just left bundle branch block. Okay, so um, in one series. Uh, that, that was reported in the medical literature, about 25% of, of cases um, of, S, of uh, ST elevation amongst chest pain patients was left ventricular hypertrophy. And then between left bundle branch block and paced rhythm was like another 25% um, of patients that were not experiencing acute myocardial infarction. So you have a lot of patients with left ventricular hypertrophy. You have a lot of patients with left bundle. You have a lot of patients with paced rhythm. Why do these conditions cause ST segment elevation? What is the reason? The reason is these are so-called secondary STT wave abnormalities. Secondary to what though? Secondary to abnormal depolarization. You can think of it that way. So with a left bundle branch block, okay, you have a conduction block right there in the, in the left bundle branch. And so what ends up happening is the right ventricle depolarizes first, and then you have the cell-to-cell -cell depolarization that goes from, from right to left. You can think of that as an abnormal uh, depolarization that widens the QRS complex. When you have an abnormal depolarization, you have an abnormal repolarization. And that is what's happening uh, in, in so many of these, we call them mimics of acute myocardial infarction. What they are is just abnormal depolarizations that are having a corresponding abnormal repolarization. So in the case of left bundle branch block, what you will see for a normal left bundle branch block is that you will have ST, ST segment shift and a T wave that is pointed the opposite direction of the QRS complex. And we refer to this as the rule of appropriate ST segment and T wave discordance in the presence of left bundle branch block. Yes, you can use things like Scarbose's criteria or hopefully Smith's modification to Scarbose's criteria. Look for things like concordant ST segment elevation, which is ST elevation in the same direction as the QRS complex. That's all true. There, it is possible to identify acute STEMI in the presence of left bundle branch block. But remember, it is a lot easier to be able to tell when something goes from normal to abnormal than determine when something goes from abnormal to more abnormal. So it is very challenging to identify acute STEMI in the presence of things like paced rhythm or left bundle branch block. Here's an example of a uh, paced rhythm. Now, you may look at this, and in fact, this was kind of a strange case because um, there was a, a paramedic that uh, was out, that you know, taking care of a, uh, a middle-aged, kind of younger middle-aged guy that was that was postictal from a seizure, and for some reason, uh, this twelve lead ECG was performed, and um, our paramedic took a look at this monstrous ST segment elevation. Um, that you can really appreciate there in leads three and AVF, um, and and it just really concerned him, right? So they announced code STEMI from the field and brought this patient into the emergency department. Well, which one of our rules did they violate? Clinical correlation. Okay, so this person's postictal from a seizure. How does that correlate to ACS? It really kind of doesn't, right? So the pretest probability of this being acute STEMI was really, really low. Okay, didn't wasn't really a good match. Now the other thing that's important is um, the physical exam, right? So when we're undressing somebody from the waist up, a lot of times people go, "Why do we need to undress them? Why can't we just stick the leads down the person or up the person's shirt?" Because we're supposed to be doing a physical exam on these folks. 
When you expose a chest pain patient from the waist up, it gives you an opportunity to look for things like surgical scars if, if they've ever had cabbage uh, and you know assess for JVD and look for things like implantable medical devices. Had the staff done that or paid attention, they would have seen that this patient did in fact have a, um, a pacemaker. Now, I wasn't there and didn't see uh, this patient, but when they called me about this case and asked me about it, I looked at the CCG and I said, well, it's a paced rhythm. And they're like, no, I, I don't think so. And I said, no, it's definitely a paced rhythm. How did I know that? How did I know that this was a paced rhythm? Okay, well, for one thing, um, this shows a sinus rhythm with a wide QRS complex with left bundle branch morphology and a left axis deviation. Okay, and that is really typical for a pacing lead in the apex of the right ventricle. Okay, I don't expect everybody to know that, but how else? Okay, that's the first thing I noticed. So when I see a wide complex rhythm, I'm always thinking of the possibility that I'm dealing with a paced rhythm. It's part of my differential diagnosis for any wide complex rhythm. Could this be a paced rhythm? If you take a really, really low, close look here um, at leads V4 and V5, you will notice you can see these tiny little pacing artifacts there that really tip me off. You need a trained eye, but if you don't look for it, you're not gonna see it. So I take, I really scrutinize lead V4 and V5. Now it's really hard and sometimes almost impossible to see this on a 12 lead ECG, especially as we often do in EMS, we set what is referred to as the high frequency low pass filter. We, we take that filter down from 150 Hertz down to like 40 Hertz. Why do we do that? We do that because it helps reduce things like 60 cycle interference, uh, but it doesn't really interfere with the ST segment elevation. So, you know, I would encourage people to go ahead and set that. Uh, it's still diagnostic mode, okay? Um, but for a pre-hospital ECG, if you have the opportunity, I would always tend to set that filter down to 40 hertz from 120. But one of the consequences of doing that is it makes it a lot more difficult to appreciate the pacing spikes uh, on the 12 lead ECG. So just keep that in mind. Um, now, when you have a paced rhythm, um, again, you can think of that as an abnormal depolarization. When you have an abnormal depolarization, you have an abnormal repolarization in the opposite direction. Now, you might look at that and go, my gosh, but look at how much ST elevation there in the inferior leads. Yes, that's true but we don't know how deep those S waves are because they're chopped off by the bottom of the ECG paper. You know, if you have, um, you know, a 50 millimeter deep S wave there, yes, you're gonna have massive ST segment elevation and T waves in the opposite direction. And that's just a normal finding, whether it's paste rhythm or left bundle branch block. So you wanna keep that in mind. This is why so many STEMI systems in the presence of wide QRS complex they just don't allow any uh, pre-hospital STEMI activation, at least not without ECG uh, transmission. So, but paced rhythm and left bundle, two very, very common causes of ST segment elevation. Okay, speaking of left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, um, most computerized interpretive algorithms, uh, except for one that I know of that is not good with LVH at all. Uh, I won't mention any names, but most of our computerized uh, algorithms do a pretty good job spotting LVH, okay? Left ventricular hypertrophy tends to be an anterior STEMI mimic, okay? Um, so if you look here in the right precordial leads V1, uh, V2, and V3, you've got these really, really, really deep S waves. Well, when you have really, really, really deep S waves, you will have ST segment elevation in the opposite direction uh, and that tends to be a normal finding with left ventricular hypertrophy. As a matter of fact, it's really rare. It's very rare to find a true example of anterior STEMI that meets the precordial lead um, criteria, voltage criteria for L LVH. Why is that? It's not that patients with LVH don't experience acute STEMI. It's just that for reasons that are really not clear, acute STEMI tends to attenuate that voltage. So those S waves tend to get pulled up during the acute phase of acute STEMI. So always question the diagnosis of acute STEMI 
in the face of really, really, really deep S waves. So you you can see there you've got some SD segment elevation in lead V2, you know, at least a couple millimeters, but you can see that QRS complex is really, 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 really deep. Stop, think about it. It's probably just LVH with uh, ST segment elevation in the opposite direction, which is perfectly normal. Again, in one series, the most common cause of ST segment elevation amongst chest pain patients, left ventricular hypertrophy. So between left bundle, pace rhythm, and uh, LVH are the three most common causes of ST segment elevation. We also have the so-called male pattern. Okay, so uh, this in this particular example here, this was just a perfectly fit 27-year-old firefighter. We recorded this ECG during training when we were just putting leads on each other and practicing acquiring a 12-lead ECG. Now, you will notice, now this guy is extremely fit, okay? In addition to being a CrossFitter and stuff like that, he had, um, he had tried to become a uh, pararescueman when he was in the military and he made it down to the last two and he like ruptured his uh, ear inside the swimming pool. So this is a really, really fit guy, a really, really good guy. Um, but you'll notice like he's really young, he's 27 years old. We've got sinus bradycardia on the monitor, which is pretty common for early repole. Some, now, what is the definition of early repolarization? It's just ST segment elevation without underlying cardiac disease. Um, but some purists, to call something true early repole, you know, you have to meet certain criteria. Other people group together the so-called male pattern with early repole. Um, so we don't have the notch J points here and the classic, uh, the classic early repole. So I'll just call this the male pattern. But again, pretest probability. This is a young guy. He had no symptoms at all. So under no circumstances would we want to call a code STEMI for something like this. On the other hand, if this was a 68-year-old male who was acutely ill and diaphoretic and was having chest pain, uh, and, and, and didn't look well, I, I would be pretty impressed with that T wave there in lead uh, V2 and maybe V3. I would want more evidence. If this was developing anterior STEMI, I would hope that it would cross over to the limb leads and unlock a reciprocal change or that those R waves there, see you, you've got nice R waves there in V2 and V3 and V4. And with early repoll or the, the male pattern, you should have that intact R wave progression. If that were obliterated, if we had changes on serial obtained ECGs, I would want something like that to help rule in acute anterior STEMI. But just remember, fit younger people tend to have a little bit of ST elevation um, and some prominent T waves. And it's just because they're young and fit. So here is an example of a more classic early repoll. And as a matter of fact, the computer gets it, right? If you look at there, it says sinus bradycardia, which by the way, uh, early repoll, you will almost always have sinus bradycardia. And if you put these folks on a bike and get their heart rate up, these classic signs of e early repoll may even go away. So, but you can see here really, really prominent R waves there in lead V3 and V4. And you can see that little notch in the J point. Um, and, and it's got the so-called upwardly concave ST segment elevation, sometimes referred to as kind of like a smiley faced ST segment elevation. Um, and that notch on the J point even can look like the, you know, the barb on a hook. Um, so again, this is a relatively young person, age 45 years old. Uh, if memory serves, this was a uh, young African-American male that had just been uh, involved in a... Um, a bus, he was driving a bus and got in an accident and uh, he was really worried about losing his job. He was having a little bit of an anxiety attack. We brought him to the hospital, but he looked really fit. He was kind of young um, and he's got classic early repole here. So sinus bradycardia, um, we've got notch J points, upwardly concave ST segment uh, elevation, no reciprocal changes. And, um, and generally speaking, um, no changes on serially obtained ECG. So that is kind of the difference of your classic early repoll versus the male pattern. And then finally, um, we've already talked about this a little bit, pericarditis. As Stephen St uh, Smith likes to say, diagnose pericarditis at your peril. Uh, 
meaning it's rare. Again, if you're a Vegas odds maker and some just because someone presents with, um, you know, diffuse SD segment elevation, does that guarantee that they're not having a massive STEMI? It does not. Okay, so be careful. Be careful before you assume that someone is experiencing pericarditis. But in this particular case, uh, the patient had, you know, recent sickness of infectious etiology, um, was having kind of like a burning sensation in the chest. It felt better leaning forward. Uh, as you can see, you have ST elevation in lead one and lead two. Lead one is a high lateral lead. Lead two is an inferior lead. They are normally reciprocal to one another, but we have ST elevation uh, in both. We've got notch J point there in uh, lead V4 and V5. Um, and our wave progression is intact. That's important too. So we have no pathological Q waves here. Our wave progression is intact and all these different criteria kind of fit with the total cl clinical presentation. But again, Pericarditis uh, is pretty rare. Uh, in one series, only you know two, uh, two patients out of over 200 that presented with both chest pain and ST segment elevation. So ACS far, far more common, uh, but pericarditis can result in ST segment elevation for sure. Okay, so appreciate you guys sticking with me for this long. Finally, let's ask. Have we gone as far as we can go with the entire STEMI, non-STEMI paradigm? I'm sure you've already guessed my answer. Uh, and I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say we've taken it as far as we can ride this horse. Is it better than Q-Wave, non-Q-Wave MI? Definitely. Um, there's no doubt it's more useful to focus on ST elevation than the presence of a Q-Wave. The presence of a Q-Wave doesn't give you any information about whether or not this person needs to go to the cath lab now. The problem I have with the conventional millimeter criteria is we are missing a lot of occluded arteries. And so um, that wouldn't be so bad, except all we do is cath them late. They lose a lot of heart muscle and they're diagnosed with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. The world keeps on spinning and we just rinse and repeat and it happens over and over and over again. And so um, you've probably seen the OMI manifesto, if you're a member of the FOMED community, um, and that, uh, written by Steve Smith and, and others, that argues we should be thinking more in terms of occlusion myocardial infarction or non-occlusion myocardial infarction, so that when we are faced with things like hyperacute T waves that do not meet the conventional criteria, or the so-called de-winter T waves. So this pattern of ST segment depression, which Amal Matu calls them rocket T waves, but hyper acute looking T waves with J point depression, very symmetrical looking. About 2% of our um, LAD occlusions can present with the winter T waves. Electrocardiographically silent high lateral STEMI, or just if you wanna think about it as STEMI, with less than one millimeter of ST segment elevation. These are folks that still have an occluded epicardial coronary artery that would definitely benefit from a trip to the cardiac cath lab. Or uh, probably the worst example is acute isolated posterior STEMI. So often it's right there and just missed and our STEMI systems are not accountable. We're not accountable when we miss these, okay? We're not admitting it. Uh, we're not having a meeting. We're not doing a root cause analysis. We're not asking ourselves how to prevent that from happening again. And for all these reasons, um, and they're getting thrown out of the hospital STEMI data because they don't meet criteria. And so if it's to the point where we've mastered how to game the system to hit our door to balloon times or our first medical contact to balloon times, um, then we're complacent and we're not doing our best to save heart muscle at that point. And so I would argue that we've taken the STEMI non-STEMI paradigm as far as we can take it. Folks, that was a long presentation. I appreciate you uh, sticking in there with me. Um, feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions about this presentation or if I can be of any assistance to you. Thank you so much for attending Refresh 2021. I hope you're enjoying it. Thanks again. Have a great day.